welcome everybody. It's great to see you here. Thank you, Kyle, for everything, for setting us up for, with this. We're very excited to, to share this presentation with you guys and just kind of connect uh, on voiceover. So it's really great to be here. Yes, and just out of the gate, my name's Amanda, this is Mike, and uh, what an honor to be here. We have been with Voices.com for so many years, and we wouldn't be here presenting this a webinar if it wasn't for voices.com so it's really gone in a full circle and we're really honored to be here and share our knowledge over the last past decade combined 25 plus years of experience presenting today to you mastering the long game so First of all, if you're here right now, you have taken the first step in your voiceover career, and this is how it starts. Um, wherever you are, um, welcome, and we're excited to answer any questions that you have. Do you want to start with how you got into voiceover? Sure. So um, in the beginning, I was a singer-songwriter. I was in theater, always into the, the arts, um, singing in rock bands, touring the United States, all the craziness. I ended up uh, becoming a radio DJ. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be a radio DJ. This is gonna be my career. It was, it was fun. But then somehow, uh, you know, in radio, you do the pre-production, you go in the back and you uh, voice the commercials for the local, um, the, the local companies and whatnot. And I fell in love with taking a piece of copy and reading it in a microphone. Like there was something magical in that moment. And I decided, I need to figure out a way to do this. And I was in Saskatchewan at the time, um, uh, working, yeah, working in um, radio at 104.9 The Wolf. So, so which, which is actually how we met. Yeah. Because when I first, when we first met, I was just not just a musician, but I was a musician. I had no intentions. I had no acting background. I had no intentions of becoming a voice actor. But uh, with her drive and passion about voiceover, I was able to kind of support her in a more back-end engineering format so for me it was it was a little bit more delayed than Amanda she kind of went head first into it with radio and then continued afterwards but uh, again when we first started I was I had no no idea that I would also become a full-time voice actor and so along our journey we've had many you know trials and errors successes and and failures or learning opportunities but um, I have been nominated for three voice arts awards um, it, that brought me to um, uh, Warner Brothers Studio in LA for the Sovas, including and including Total Body of Work, which is like the the basically like actor of the year, actress of the year, and and I think it was between her and two or three other individuals. So that was very cool. So so basically, it it, it all started with uh, Mike and I um, just having a, a passion for it and and figuring out okay, how are we going to make this our careers? So um, the first step, we'll do. Um, I'll, I'll just say that the first part of it, like entering the career when we decided to actually get into voiceovers, there was a lot of ignorance as far as like how to actually do it as a career. Because yes, Amanda had her radio experience and I had uh, music production experience, but we didn't know the industry, the voiceover industry, the genres, the, the demos, the coaches, the platforms, everything like that. So it was all very much a slow trial and error process of just discovering this industry, which I think served us actually with some of the ignorance. And, um, but yeah, one step at a time. Absolutely. So now our kids are in voiceovers. Um, our, our seven-year-old son has worked for Lego, um, Star Wars. Uh, he just signed his second season as the lead in a Fisher Price um, online series. He's in a Chip and Potato on Netflix. He's also like on the big screen in movie theaters everywhere Actually, right now. Just not this last Friday, but Friday <laughs> before his movie called Two Hearts premiered. And that was his first on-screen feature film in theater. So that was pretty exciting for him as well. And this was all because of us doing voiceovers. So it was all because we you know, have different agents now and we have different foots in the door and we've met different people. So now our children um, have a passion for it. So, so it's really cool to um, see the journey and the potential, just, just knowing that literally in this business, anything is possible. And, and with with our experience over the years, over, we said 25 years of combined experience, we've been able to kind of compartmentalize some of these practices as far as what worked, what didn't work. And that's what we're going to share with you as far as creating the long game. We've been doing this for, for like we said, over a decade 
completely working from home, full-time professional voice actors. So we're gonna share some of that with you today. And so, because we didn't have um, a destination in mind, we didn't know where we were going. Now we have the sort of uh, experience, so to say, to um, share with you uh, what you can do um, to make your career extremely successful. So we start with, you don't just jump in a car without a destination in mind. So it's all about having a vision for your career and then just being flexible as you go. I think being open to it, the whole concept of jumping in a car without a destination is you burn all that gas without getting anywhere necessarily that you have any intention on going on. So it's having the vision that creates more, more time efficiency because as we know, that's the most important aspect of life that the, the most valuable commodity is our time. So if we can become more efficient with that, which is what we're presenting here, then you can kind of get to your end, end game a little bit quicker. Right, so three fundamentals in mastering the long game. Starting with. Number one, the business of voiceover. So we want you to look at your career as a business. You are now um, an entrepreneur that is wearing many hats. So one of the things that uh, we, when we started, we literally, uh, when we would book a job, we would have a big whiteboard and we would write the name of the client and in, how in, much they owed. An erasable marker. <laughs> and so if it ever got bumped, then it was like, oh, I guess we didn't get paid for that job because like, we missed it. Didn't we have that job from that guy? I, I don't know. Yeah. Can't undo that erase. So we really learned uh, through so many different, uh, you know, business uh, books, uh, masterminds, coaching, um, networking opportunities, coaching, how to make this a, a business. So it's really good to look at it as um, you're an entrepreneur and this is your business. And one of the one of the most difficult things, I think the hardest lessons we've learned as professional voice actors, as entrepreneurs is setting those personal and work boundaries. Because when we first started, we didn't have kids. We didn't have any responsibilities besides you know, renting our apartment. And it was just, we would, an audition would come in at 10 at night. We would just drop everything and do it. We would wake up at five in the morning and just audition, audition, audition. We, there was no line between where work en ended and our personal life began. It was just, that was it. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that we're growing more and more now that we have a family and we have other goals and intentions in mind as well. As, as far as life experience, we're learning to create boundaries around, you know, our client engagement, as far as you know, turnaround times and stuff like that. But I do believe that part of our success was our, our passion and our fire towards it, that, mm -hmm. that we were, you know, that was top priority. We were passionate and excited about it. Mm -hmm. And so we, we grew a, a reputation of, of amazing customer service, high quality audio. And, and that really served us in the long game as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, and as far as, um, setting boundaries like I do I do believe that in the beginning you do have to have a sense of of hustle and you, a passion towards it unless you just want it to be a part-time job or you really do want to have two careers going and ease into it but if you want to make this your full-time career uh, you kind of have to have a um, I wouldn't say an obsession well in a book I'm reading Brendan Bruchard uh, habits of um, high performers he talks about like loving your your passion so much that you're obsessed with it so um, it, it's 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 up to you and and you know with the boundaries that you set but I, I do think though that as far as the VO career specifically uh, you will get out of it what you put into it that's and true so that's that's very much how serious you want to take it um, if you're willing to jump into the deep end and go for it, or if, or if you're, you know, dipping your toes, you can see success either way, but it depends again with that end vision in mind. Do you want to be a full-time voice actor? And, and our next point here is that growth is essential. We've, we've acquired over five, 600 clients over the last decade plus of, of working in this industry. And there's always going to be times where some clients are quiet, some clients are busy. And so there's always been a growth mindset as far as you know and and the number one game that we have the number one tool we have is auditioning mm -hmm. that's like the lifeblood of our careers and so just having that growth mindset not necessarily resting all your eggs in one basket yep. Yep. <laughs> and uh and just being uh being open to to continually growing Absolutely. So, and, and that means in, yeah, in all areas, um, watching for trends is, is a big one. Like when we started, I was just thinking about this this morning, 
um, the explainer videos were really popular then. And I know they're still popular. There's a lot of the, the 2D explainer videos out there. Illustrated, yeah. Illustrated, like, this is Julia. Julia works at the store, but she has a problem and we're gonna solve it. Um, so those are really big back when we started and I feel like they're, they're still going, but one of the things that has kind of become the more popular thing as far as trends go is the really relatable, like right now with everything going on in the world, people really want to feel that they can trust you and that they can look to you for advice. So a lot of businesses are doing the more uh, mantra based like business manifestos where it's like, we know how you're feeling right now and we can help. And so they're just really trying to relate. So it's and, and being that, aware of that. That took that took time because that grew over the years and it's become, you know, the number one thing because I don't know if it's generationally or what it is, but it seems like people more and more can notice when they're being sold to. Mm -hmm. And the the point of voice acting is to be able to to portray that script with honesty and and human relatability, you know. So so that's really become a forefront trend. In, in the industry. Yes, and so the next point we have is branding. So look at yourself as a brand and there's, you know, different books and, and you know, Googling on how to make yourself a good brand, but really um, taking your voice, your style, your money voice, where you book the most work and making it into a brand. So what are your brand colors? Um, who, who, who do you relate to? Uh, just really looking into branding and having your website and everything coincide. Some people say even having um, emojis that you often use. So when my friend Lisa does a cartwheel emoji, like I always know it's her. So just things that people can relate to you. A, a slogan that you say when you're proposing um, jobs in your template, what is something that you always say that's true to your brand? And remembering again that this is the long game. This isn't, you know, if you're just signed up for voices.com and you're just entering the industry, you don't have to worry about mastering all this, but this is something, if you want to turn this into a lifelong career, mm -hmm. these are aspects that you could definitely consider to help improve things. Absolutely. So take notes. And I literally have notes that I took 12 years ago. I've, I took um, classes um, in um, LA um, just, you know, for, for a long time, we, we went down to LA for a while. Uh, so, and these are things that I always look back to. So maybe you'll take notes now. It won't relate completely now everything, but you'll look back and you'll be like, okay, now this is something that um, I can do. So, so a next level of the business that we've, you know, more recently, probably within the, the last two to three years been taking more seriously is, is client engagement and the self-marketing, self-branding aspect of things. Mm -hmm. Because I find that, um, I don't know if it's a growing trend of that whole, you know, human connection aspect of business, because what we do is very isolating you know, working from home in our in our sound booths, mm -hmm. um, working with clients digitally most of the time. We do do some in in studio work, but the majority of what we've done over the years has been by ourselves through a computer, and that's it. So engaging with your clients, letting them know you're human, can also help to kind of endear each other. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you just you get your basic emails. Here's a script. Thanks. Here's the file. Awesome. You know, there's just some human aspect of things that are missed. Mm -hmm. And so when you engage with your clients, what we do, we do a monthly newsletter updating people what we've been up to just as a family, you know, our clients have really loved that to see, you know, like successes or things like um, I make meditations. And so we when, you know, coronavirus came, we sent all our um, our clients um, uh, healing um, for the world meditation. And they just they really like that. So things that are true to your brand that could be beneficial to your clients. So not always me, me, me. It's like, OK, what what can you give to your client? What can you give them back? You sending them a, a coffee card or uh, just, you know, a really gracious thank you. Um, something that you've created to share that will brighten their day. Clients are human. They want to they, they, they wanna smile. They want to have that connection with you. Um, a lot of our clients have been with us since day one and they're like family. We, we can tell them anything. I literally write like XOXO at the end of my messages with them because we've built that relationship. So um, yeah. One funny one is sometimes when the clients, they'll send us both an audition and the client will choose out between us. So we, we generally have a friendly 
competition to see who's actually going to book the job and you know that's always something fun to, to joke around with with the client as well right or like who's if, usually if, the, winner, if the client doesn't get a file i'll be like you know that's mike's fault and <laughs> stuff like that so really no. <laughs> Yeah. Um, one quote I have here before we move on to the next um, category for mastering the long game. One quote that I like that I saw recently was don't just go with the flow, be the flow. So that's um, a really good one for doing an audition and just moving away from it. Um, we do run um, the voiceoverschool.com. And uh, one of the things that I share with my students uh, is when, when you're auditioning, uh, don't put so much weight into it and don't be looking back and did they like it did they did, like just set it and did forget it, get it. Listened to you did it get yeah. liked did and it get that, shortlisted and that's good for stats and seeing where you're at or seeing like if you tried something different in that audition and what it sounded like it's good to know but don't rely on it it's just it's like just move on so being the flow and and obviously um i think we have handling rejection in another slide but yeah. just um yeah like uh, creating your own entity uh you know, looking for who you are and where you fit in and what you can bring to people, especially when you're looking for agents and whatnot, they want to know what can you bring? Like, what is a special thing that you can bring? And I also think it's how you can bring authenticity, because again, um, people know when you're reading, people can hear when you're performing, people can hear when you're speaking with your heart and your authenticity. So it's, it is important to, to build that, that knowledge of self, Mm -hmm. you know, which, which comes through branding, which comes through practicing your voice, you know, and, and it's, it's important because in the long game, I, when I first started, I wanted to get all the, the big, you know, big commercial projects. I wanted to be a Disney prince. I still do, but <laughs> it's, it's where I ended up fitting to begin with was e-learning. I mm -hmm. found that, it, you know, I don't have a very special or unique voice, but I have a very conversational guy next door and I was able to teach a lot of people about healthcare benefits or about how to build a burger or things mm -hmm. like that where necessarily I, I didn't necessarily, you know, see that as a vision for myself. But by knowing what my voice can do, what I can do, I kind of fit the niche where it worked best and then grew from there. Now I do I do a, a bunch of commercial work. Absolutely. I'm still not a Disney prince, but I'm working on that. <laughs> You're a prince to me. So, yes. oh, <laughs> so the next um, mastering the long game category we have today is performance. So we're performers, we're actors, we're, um, you know, we are the, the thespians behind the microphone. So this is something that we need to master and we need to be the best that we can be behind the mic and it doesn't stop. 13 years later, I am still trying to get better. I am still trying to master my reads. I'm still trying to be a better performer and look for ways that I can stand out and be different. So the number one tip that we have um, with this is investing in yourself. So uh, when we started, we were in a closet in a basement suite uh, with kids running upstairs. We didn't have kids at the time. No, we were, we were yeah. basement you know, suite, two kids, like loud kids to us then was like, annoying <laughs> and now we have two of them so we understand now we get it but we lived in the basement suite so, so we had like banging going up and we um would tape our scripts the, in the closet the clothes yeah they were spread the clothes were spread and then we we'd tape our paper printed scripts to the bar yes and, and then we, we had like a tiny little thin sheet blanket behind us blocking out sound <laughs> right and i think at the time we had um, a, a laptop that we recorded on into garage band and then we had a 300 hundred dollar microphone that we put on uh, our credit cards we you know i was a waitress you were working on the oil rigs i'm pretty sure we'd actually had some drinks before we decided <laughs> to get that microphone because we were like you know what let's just do it yeah it, it was just that like you know that okay go for it but um yeah just, but but we had the you had, you had the understanding and passion about your drive for the voiceovers. Absolutely. But it's sometimes that barrier to entry for us was like, well, it's expensive, like it's three hundred dollars. It's it? an investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, now it's like looking back, it's like you know, signing up for Voices.com was an investment, and it was scary. But I would, if I went back, I would do it a hundred times over. Like I am so grateful. If you're on the fence of getting that microphone, signing up for Voices.com, getting the coaching 
you've got to jump in. You, you can't just have your toe in the water. You, you have to make it happen. If you truly in your heart believe that this is the career for you, then you've got to make the investment. So um, even now, when we started, we didn't invest in, in really expensive demos. We would just make our own off of um, you know auditions that we were allowed to use or- I think it was a good eight years into our careers that we actually got a professional demo. Yeah, I didn't need, like, we didn't need them. We kept booking work just through auditions and having compilations of work that we had done. So, so the, the, the professional demo thing off the bat isn't something that needs to be done. But then as you move on and you want to get some really um, uh, amazing agents in, in big cities and big markets or whatnot, then, then you can look at getting a professional demo made. But um, just always having a look and an oversight of your website, your, your demos, um, where you're at is a really important thing to do to just keep growing, keep investing. Even now in my career, I'm investing a, a, a big handful of money into masterminds and, and, you know, just things that I can do to even grow my, my, um, my business more and my um even like self-confidence and direction yeah, and absolutely or even being here being able to talk to you right now it's like this has been part of the growth and the journey so so don't ever stop investing in yourself and and growing one one really awesome investment that we've made occasionally throughout the year has been you know acting classes or improv mm -hmm. this was a, a few years back i took my first improv class since high school because I, again i wasn't much of a acting uh individual beforehand but you know, stuff that makes you really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You're going to be dealing eventually with a directed phone session or an in-studio session where you have to be live thinking off the cuff. And improv makes me very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very comfortable inside my four padded walls performing <laughs> how I want it. In fact, when I first started voiceover, um, she would send me auditions. She'd be like, I got a client who's asking for a male voice actor. And I'd be like, okay, leave the apartment. And I'm going to go do this on my own. And then I would literally like go in, do 200 takes, come out, edit everything in headphone land, and then invite her back in. <laughs> and it's just, it's one of those things where the more you open yourselves up to, to improv and flexibility and directed sessions, it makes regular life and auditioning even that much more easy. Yeah. So if you can expose yourself to uncomfortable situations, it makes your regular life that much more comfortable. And I read a I read a quote once that made a lot of sense. Um, the energy of stage fright and um, stage presence it's it's the same energy. So you're still going to feel the nerves and the the you know heart palpitations and like the the sweat, <laughs> shaking sweats. It's it's going to be there whether you do it or not. So, so our advice is to lean into the, the stage presence part. Don't give into the stage fear or the stage fright. Put yourself in that uncomfortable situation and you'll just grow as a performer um, because of that. Like, and, that, and that's again how we got to where we are is putting ourselves in those really uncomfortable situations where, where clients, like there'd be like 10 people on the phone and they're all giving you different direction and they're not happy with your read or, but it's, it's being in those moments and staying present is, is how you get better. It's also acknowledging that you do feel fearful in this moment. So it's, it's, and seeing that and seeing it for what it is, it's understanding that you're going to have to go through some discomfort to grow and, and evolve like that. For example, my very first directed in-person session was for a phone system for a, a, an apparel company. And there were three dudes on the other <laughs> side, obviously looking to have some fun with me you know, kind of nice, but kind of not nice. <laughs> I was, I was so anxious and fearful that I was having trouble breathing and finishing sentences and actually getting <laughs> words out, you know, before having to breathe two, three times within one sentence. And they'd be like, dude, can you yeah. finish a sentence without breathing? I'm like one sec. And literally I, I at one point buckled over and, and had to breathe and catch my breath because I was so anxious and nervous. I remember that. Actually, we do have a photo from that session. And uh, that was my first. We yeah. should have put that in the slideshow yeah. where he looks like he's smiling and happy to be <laughs> doing a session. But really, he was so freaked out. <laughs> Every, but then I got home, went in my own booth and life was easier. Yeah. And then, and then, then the like, next oh. session, it was like, OK, you know what? I've been here and even worse. And now we'll get a little bit better. And now I'm very comfortable in directed sessions, in studio sessions, because I would always lose that authenticity, that that warmth, that performance aspect when I was dealing with the fear and anxiety of performance. Mm -hmm. And so 
again, take, going back to, to taking the classes and the improv and, mm-hmm. and whatnot is, is really important. Absolutely. And then um, in performance, taking risks, not always doing the same thing over and over again, like trying something different. Um, you, might, you might discover that you can do something that you didn't know that you could. That was a big part in the beginning for us as well is I, I auditioned for everything. I just wanted to see what my voice was capable of doing right now, even with our students. I, I hear them do a read and I know that um, if they were just like doing a little bit more exploration and trying different things and going more energy, like over the top energy, just trying different things can be really beneficial I think I think I took a note on that you may have been trying to guide me early on where it was like go pretend to go over the top Mm -hmm. and my over the top was still like "Mm," you Mm -hmm. know like it wasn't that big and so just taking risks and seeing what over the top feels like even if you don't submit that audition but just getting you to a place of just like wildness and then dialing it back with a little bit of you know comfort and confidence absolutely so um how is your audio checking your your audio quality and your you know getting feedback on your performance voices.com has a wonderful um you know uh service where you can get your auditions checked um so just um making sure is that right kyle like i think i'm pretty sure you guys have a or at least um initial signups or something like that where you can or for audio checks Yeah. yeah so we don't have something that does an audio check um per se um and honestly, if you reach out to your account manager, uh, if you're a premium member, you can reach out to support and, and you can get a general idea. Like, you know, does this sound like it needs some work or not? <laughs> we can definitely right. give you some direction. Um, but as for like an audio check itself, um, we don't come back with like reading. Okay. Out of, of different awesome. Things. Sorry. I just wanted to make sure, so, but just finding someone like uh, the voiceover school, um, we do, we can do that for you and just see how you're how you're sounding. And, and I think sharing is, is important. Um, with the voiceover school, we have, we have a, an interactive Facebook group where we ask people to post their practice auditions when they start working through the material, because we were just talking about the fear and anxiety aspect of things. Mm. Once you, if you put it out there, then you can grow from there. Yeah. If there's never that initial feedback, that initial, like where you're at and it's, yes, it's easy to compare yourself to say, Amanda, when I first started, I was like, I'm not a voice actor. She's the pro. How can I compare? You know, and it's not about comparison. It's about constant Mm self-improvement and, and being truthful about where you're at. Mm -hmm. If you need performance issue, uh, performance coaching, if you need your audio quality to be in better shape, to be competitive, Mm -hmm. these are all things that you won't know unless you put it out there sometimes and ask a coach, ask a supportive group, um, and then it comes down to to the next aspect. Our our group is really amazing with that. We have some oh, phenomenal uh, talent that that are you know will jump in and help and and be really supportive with that. So uh, dealing with a, uh, rejection is the next one. I mean we we've kind of touched on this and and this is just par for the course. It's, it's like auditioning, dealing with rejection. It's mm-hmm. just it's part it's part yeah. of the industry. And yeah. um, you know putting all your eggs in one basket with an audition. You know it's just like people can hear that. People can hear the stress of like, I need this job in order to pay this membership. You know, people Mm -hmm. can hear that. So understanding that you're not going to be right for everything. You know, even if it's a beautiful performance, it might not fit what they're thinking that day. Um, An audition you're maybe not as fully happy with, maybe perfect for something that's, you know, someone else is choosing. So it's just understanding that don't take it personally. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's par for the course. And if there are uh, performance improvements to be made, then so be it. But just understanding that, you know, every single day, I've been auditioning for over a decade. And I think my lifetime booking rate is like three to 4%, you know, Mm -hmm. so in in 100 auditions, out of 196 of them will be rejected or not listened to or, Mm -hmm. you know, not selected. So it's, it's just part of the game, just like batting, right? Just like baseball. Mm -hmm. If you have a 300, you know, rating, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. So just knowing that, that you will face rejection, don't take it personally. If you can take any sort of learning or growth out of it, do that. And just know that you're going to keep stepping, you're going to keep working. And one thing that really helped me in the beginning was to not um, just rely on one avenue. Like I, 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 I really encourage our students to look locally. Uh, sometimes um, someone's dad will own a restaurant and I'll say, 
do the voiceover for the restaurant, like do a little self-made commercial and, and voice voice the, the commercial or, or, the, or their phone system or the phone yeah. system um, where, you know, someone might work and just just looking for ways that you can contribute. When I first started, my friend owned an eyebrow threading company in Yale Town and I did her phone system and she threaded my eyebrows. So just looking for ways that you can, um, you know, uh, meet with people and do exchanges or just growing and growing in it. It, it, it takes time. So yes, and rejection is definitely part of it. It's, it's to be expected. Our last category is self care. I think is is one of the most important because this is this goes beyond just voiceover. This is this is like personal health care. Yeah, so, um, and by health we mean wellness because our voice is our instrument, and your voice is connected to everything. So uh, it just comes across in your audio if you know, you're not feeling good. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, there have been times when I have gone in the booth and I'm not really having the best day and I'll book a job. That, that's that's part of the performance aspect, I think, is, is having the tools to be able to ground yourself before an audition, mm -hmm. you know, as far as performance. But, um, you know, say, for example, you would reach levels of stress because of something going on in life. And then your mouth, your you'd have a lot of mouth noise or clickiness, or yes. I would have that. Yeah. And you can tell that you can hear it in the audio, you know, like you can hear, you can hear, you know, in, in authenticity, you can hear hesitation. You can hear uh, like just reading, you can mm -hmm. hear that stuff. So, yeah. so if you're able to, to build these self-care tools to increase your, your self-confidence belief in the self and the mindset, you can, you know, train, train your voice, train your body to perform even when, you know, you have bad, bad and, days. Too. And, you know, Mike does crazy things like he does like cold immersion and, and, and breath work. And I do meditation stuff. And if that's not for you, that that's OK. Like it's finding what works for you. Um, so it, it, even small steps like going for a walk, getting fresh air before you record or just, you know, having that moment where you take in a few deep breaths and, you know, exhale uh, when you exhale, make it a little bit longer than your inhale, because that's uh, telling your body that you're in rest and reset and repair mode. So just like long exhale before you read and even if you are in a directed session um you you know you can don't be afraid to breathe minute. yeah and don't be afraid, don't be afraid to, to buckle over and breathe to take a minute or do it or do what you need to do i i do lead-ins even if i'm on a a call with a bunch of people i was in studio last week um downtown Vancouver and I was I was doing lead-ins uh, and if you don't know what a lead-in is it's something to um jump you into the script so if your script is investing in updating demos uh, so you want to do something that will get your voice ready for that line. So I'll be like, did you know, investing in updating demos. So just uh, a lead in is something that you say before you start. And if you're recording from home, you can do the lead in and then um, edit it out after. That's just an aside. But sometimes that can help you get into the most engineers don't care either, you know, as far as if you do lead-ins in live sessions. Oh yeah, like for too. sure. So, so yeah, so finding the things that work for you in terms of, um, you know, building self-confidence, believing in yourself. When we talk about the long game, um, you know, this is belief in yourself for multiple years. This, you know, just being, just knowing five years, yes, I'm going to still be here. I'm still going to be doing this. Even, even over a decade into this, I'm still working through different levels of self-belief. You know, like, do I believe that I can be successful on a, on a five figure commercial campaign, you know, where I'm like, yeah, sure. I can, I can get the, the, the three figure uh, jobs, no problem. But it's like, it's every level. There's always a new level of belief you can work and progress towards. Yeah. And then community support. And that's something that we do provide with the voiceover school is just having, you know, support voices.com is so wonderful with, um, you know, their podcasts and blogs. doing webinars like this blogs, they've always really created an amazing community. So just getting involved and letting yourself be seen and heard and asking questions being here right now. This is like a number. This is a wonderful step um, in um, the long game. I also believe you should be cautious around the community you're around as well, because um, what we try to create in the voiceover school group is, is, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to tell you you're amazing and you need work. You know, we're going to be supportive, but we're going to be encouraging and supportive, mm -hmm. you know, like understanding that not everyone's going to knock home runs out of the park starting at the beginning, but seeing the aspects that are, that are positive, that are, you know, key 
to where you're fitting in or what you're doing really well. Mm -hmm. And then, and then offering suggestions for improvement, you know, and, and again, they're just opinions. Yeah. And And when it comes to community, yeah, like finding the community that works for you, like we don't, we don't like negativity. We don't like uh, that kind of vibe, like, you know, putting other things or people down. So, so just finding a community that's supportive and, um, you know, can help you with your vision. So speaking of vision, one thing I did when I first started was I visualized what I wanted my career to look like. I remember when we first started, I would literally write down what I wanted Um, in my voiceover career. And this is a time when I was working in nightclubs, I was waitressing, bartending, I was, you know, maybe earning $100 a week in voiceovers. It was just very, in the very beginning stages. And I set a goal for myself, and I saw what I wanted, and it came true. So that's where um, getting crystal clear on where you will see yourself can be a really positive Uh, um, tool. So, you know, how much are you earning? Um, Where are you living? What does it look like? What kind of jobs are you doing on a daily basis? What does your studio look like? So just um, really writing down and and taking a look at it every day and seeing, and you'll notice over the years, looking back now in the moment, it's, you know, it can be hard because you're like, well, I I wish I could have this. I want this, but I'm, I'm not booking yet, or I don't have that studio yet. I'm still in the closet. But just you know, like- keeping keeping that that mind in the game and you will see success. So with that, you guys, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. We're at 45 minutes. We would love to answer some questions. Actually, and like we're Kyle. 36. We've been recording for 45. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> I feel like we covered a lot. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We've covered a lot. And uh, definitely, guys, um, this will be our QA session. I know we've got some uh questions kind of roll in throughout the period there. So um, I'd be happy to get to those now. And if you have any other questions, feel free to uh, to use the uh, questions tab there and uh, we'll cover as many as we can there. So getting sure. started, um, I think the uh, first question is, um, have you ever been in a funk where you're having difficulties finding the energy to even audition? And how do you kind of get yourself out of it? What type of, you know, do you have, whether it's you know, exercises or, you know, resources, what do you guys do if you guys, you know, have say one of those bad days um, and really try to need to get out of that funk? Uh, honestly, personally, the, the one thing I do um, when I see incredible auditions, there'll be days where I'm just like, you know what, I don't have the energy to get there. I don't have the energy to, to perform, to connect, to be authentic. Um, I, do, I do any sort of state elevator. And I say this like a, like a mood booster. And this can come anywhere from, you know, just taking a breath. This can also be, um, one of my favorite things to do is literally, I'll just, I'll just open the door to my office and then I'll do as many pushups as I can. It's awesome. And <laughs> so what, what that does uh-huh. is it, is it, is it gets me in a, um, not anaerobic, but it gets me in an, in an elevated state where there's chemicals. I'm creating chemical processes through exercise that are actually boosting my, my mood and emotion. And it's very immediate, mm-hmm. you know, if, especially going to max, um, that also ha- happens on the bike. Like if, if, if I have a, some time and I can work on boosting my mood, I'll jump on, you know, the bike, the exercise bike for 15, 20 minutes and just go as hard as I can. And that usually will, will mix things up physiologically and get me in a better mood. And then I can come back in and it's, it's like a new, a new day, a new person, a new, and opportunity. You know what else helps? I have I have two brief uh, tips for you is smiling. Just literally putting a smile on your face for a few minutes um, can really help you. Like, I love this. I get to do this. Not like I have to do this. I get to do this. What a gift. I get to do this. And then auditioning is your job. It's just like if you were going to an office and you had to, you know, file paperwork and, and, and that's your job, it, it's your job. So sometimes it's like, you know, just making yourself, um, you know, do this. Sometimes you don't even feel like doing the push-ups or feel like, but just, you know, making yourself do it. And then other times just, can you, can you take the day off? Can you literally just go do something else and come in when you're feeling ready? I've definitely had times like that where I'll get really good um, auditions from my agent. I'm just, I just have to delete them. I'm like, I'm just not there right now. So honoring where you're at, but if, if you can get over it, if you can smile, if you can do the state elevators, do it. And if not, just, just take, take a couple hours or even a day and then come back when you're feeling better. Cause moods change. It's, it, it's all up and down. Your, your, your state will change. 
Awesome. Those are some really great answers. And yeah, just, just, I mean, that's one thing, whether it's a read or whether it's trying to get yourself going, I mean, you know, smiling and, and just, you know, explaining to yourself that, Hey, this is, this is a great profession to be in. I have the chance yes. opportunity to do this, um, you know, can really kind of heighten that. So um, great advice there. Um, some copy is more difficult than others. How do you deal with syntax and grammar errors or very long run on sentences? You know, <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> a little more specific on this one. Yeah. There's a couple, there's a couple options that I, that I would look at. One is, you know, consider, consider the source. Like, do they need help with their, with their copywriting? Maybe they're a mom and pop shop that, you know, they, they don't have a professional writing team or anything. So one aspect is to, is to aid them to the best of your ability and, and creating um, a good structure better words perhaps, but also being cautious because they may be very attached to how they've written it because it may be very much a passion project or something like that. Uh, another aspect is, is just reading it exactly like they have it. I've, I've done things where it, it's horrible English with crazy <laughs> punctuation with words that are totally spelt wrong, but I will perform it identically to the way they have it. And not as like a, look what you did, kind of a thing, but just like, uh, I'm going to try my best to do what you, what you have here. And maybe that'll make them question, oh, I should probably rewrite that or, or they really like it the way I did it or, you know, yeah. those are two, two ways. One of the things I like to do is just um, read it over a bunch of times and almost just uh, look at it as its own language, almost like its own thing, uh, its own entity and just trying to do what you can with it. I typically don't really change the copy in an audition. But if it's, you know, you're hired for the job, say, oh, you know, maybe they meant to say a different word there or something. But so always just doing your best and knowing that if it is an audition, then there's going to be other people that have the same thing. So just um, trusting your instinct and making a choice that, that you think works for you. Or if you're really uncomfortable with it, just <laughs> go to the next audition. Mm -hmm. If it's an audition. Yeah. <laughs> if it's an audition. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, guys. Um, and then... I know you guys mentioned, you know, trying to kind of heighten yourself and go to those, you know, different places that kind of seem over the top sometimes. Um, and we have a question from Meryl here. Depending on the script, I uh, do a second take with a different interpretation um, after following what the client originally suggests. How many takes do you submit through voices? Like, do you guys usually, when you're doing that exercise, do you guys submit multiple takes or do you guys just do a one take, one submission? Personally, I would do if it was something that I thought I was taking a risk on. I would do two. I would do two takes for sure. But um, I would slate at the beginning that the client knows to expect two takes from me, two versions, and then ensuring that if you're going to do multiple takes with a higher energy, lower energy, ensuring that they're different enough that it's not just you know hearing the same thing over and over again. Like it's got to be different enough to make multiple reads but absolutely i would do multiples but let the client know what what to expect from the audition i remember talking with joe zija who's an amazing talent on voices.com one time and he said do what you uh do what the the client wants to hear and then do one that you want to hear so um th that was his advice and for me um and the way that I've worked in my career is I usually just do one take that I feel is the best and I go on. I'm, I'm usually a one take um, person unless they ask for two. So, but really it's up to you. It's great advice, Anna. And I know that it's, it's funny to see you guys kind of split between that too, because it is so, you know, person to person. So yeah, um, really totally. see kind of both sides there. <laughs> That's awesome. We're connected and, and separated on so many things. Yes. Right? Yeah, exactly. We spend a lot of time together. <laughs> awesome. Um, Mike, I have a feeling this one leaning a little bit more in your direction after your uh, first story there. Um, first, uh, Brian wants to thank you for sharing your knowledge. He's loving the, the content here. And wanted to know, when did you first start doing you know, a live session? Like how early on in your career? And did you have, you know, a complete booth at that time? Did you still have a makeshift studio? You know, what was kind of your situation when, when you started putting your name in the hat for those auditions? So when I would say when I first started auditioning, we, I, I started even back at the beginning, very, very rarely in the closet. And we had a decent mic. Uh, it was a Rode NT1A. And I would, you know, li listening back to some of those auditions, which I thankfully kept, 
Um, you know, <laughs> you can tell the performance wasn't there. Um, but then as, as the months and years progressed, we eventually upgraded to an actual sound booth after years of closet work. Then I actually built a sound booth made out of office dividers and foam. And it was, it was cool. It did the trick. You know, we still had to turn the fridge off in the apartment. Lost a lot of food. We lost a couple of <laughs> Forget to turn it back on. <laughs> but then it was pretty early on. It was before I would even consider myself to having been a full-time voice actor, like a professional voice actor, that I did get this uh, in-studio project that was associated with a company we were doing other projects with. I was running the camera. We were doing some video projects with them. And they were like, well, we need a male voice, so let's get you in. And so it was pretty pretty early in my career. And we went in studio. They had a, you know, like a whisper room or something like that, um, where it was a bit more of a professional setting where we had headphones and stuff and they could, you know, smack talk me in my headphones <laughs> and they could very clearly hear me breathing. And so it was uncomfortable. And I, I honestly think though that that was, that was a catalyst to the career. Cause it was like, you know what, if I can deal with this, mm -hmm. luckily I had, you know, my best friend with me, even though at the time she couldn't really say anything like, good job, Mike, keep it up. You're doing great. Um, you know, it, it really helped me with, with confidence. I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive. So when was it though? Like um, it was probably, I don't know, six months. Like I, I think I had been full-time um, voice acting for maybe a year at the time and you were doing a lot of audio editing perhaps. And it was right around that time that you had the, the in, uh, person session. Yeah. And then do you remember your next one after that? Honestly, it was, it was probably a long time. It was probably years. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because, was because A, I was traumatized. <laughs> I think at that point we had, we had upgraded and, and I was able to audition and avoid in-studio work. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I hope that answers the question. It's, you but, know. But looking back now, it's like, don't, avo don't avoid it. Like try to do as many as you can. So. Looking back, it was, it was a part of my growth. As uncomfortable as it was, it was huge. For the experience factor of things and one of the thing that one of the things that we did back then too is um i was a, a, a yes person as far as like if they said do you have isdn do you have source connect um are you willing to do a phone session uh yes 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 and then when i would book something i would figure out how i was going to make it happen that's how we ended up getting source connect um it was by saying yes to the job before i had it and then figure it out like i, I, mean, I we made a few good connections with local studios exactly. that had ISDN so then we could you know book their studio and whatnot but it, yeah it's like it's like don't be afraid to to not do the job because you don't have that yet figure it out like source connect has um, a free trial uh, and and start playing around with it now and getting yourself ready that's a, a good tool too you can also buy the short term because I know some some clients won't accept uh, source connect free like it has to be a paid version oh, okay I've, oh, right. seen, I've seen that before on on some auditions but it is inexpensive if you want to try it out. And of course, sourcing a studio, which is more expensive, but to get the experience, to make the connection, you know, sometimes, especially earlier in your, your career, it's, mm -hmm. it's a good thing to take. That's another risk. You know, you're taking the investment of paying for a studio. So it's coming out of your pay cut, but you're also getting really good experience potentially, you know, for your, your real and just maybe a lifelong client. And that's part of community too. Cause when we started um, my, one of my friends, uh, she was like, I, I need a, a source connect studio. I've got this session. I'm like, come over, come we on. got you. <laughs> so <laughs> making friends and having that community too. And then you can um, use each other's studios. Or even testing source connect. We have, we've had a few students where they've, they've had sessions come up all of a sudden and they're like, I don't know if this works. So, you know, having that community support. So yes, yeah, so you you're ready. Sure, but, you make sure but, you're ready. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. And and I think that answers one of the other questions I saw there. So is Source Connect the, the main um, kind of uh, tool you guys use there for directed sessions? So we get a lot of just phone sessions. We get a lot of Skype sessions. Um, mm -hmm. Source Zoom. Connect, we do get a lot. Yeah, Zoom. But um, we've also had IPDTL, which is a, a web browser based interface. It's like Source Connect because it's digital, but mm -hmm. it's through a web browser versus an application. Um, as far as ISDN, it's kind of going on the way out a little bit. IPDTL can communicate with ISDN, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, like Source Connect is is 
probably the main one as far as it's pretty standard. Yeah, it's so between phone and Source Connect. Yeah. Yeah. We, we I'd say the majority of our sessions are phone sessions. Yeah, a literally. lot of a lot of phone sessions. I'll just put in the earbuds, and they can hear me, and they go on mute when I talk, um, and that's. The cool thing about Skype and Source Connect or even Zoom is that you can use your studio mic as the mic for the call so they can hear much more clearly what's going on in the performance. But again, you know, even in a phone session, you got your little buds or whatever microphone, it's still enough for them to hear, you know, if, if your tone's right, if the performance was correct, you read it properly. And then just being open to, you know, if anything comes up in the future and picking and doing any pickups or anything like that awesome awesome um no definitely that's uh some great answers there and this is a really good one which i think is really helpful for a lot of people to know um you know how many auditions do you guys typically try to get to a day i mean i know now that you're you're coaching as well and doing a lot more you know in that world maybe it's taken a dip but if you want to do you know when you were kind of full time full focus on that versus now kind of give, you know, a little bit of both, that would be great. But yeah, how many auditions do you do a day and how many hours are you typically spending, uh, you know, on voiceover? Sure, I'll, I'll start. I'll just, I'll just say what I'm doing right now versus what I used to do. When I started, I did literally everything that came in. I didn't, I was a, a machine. I, I was doing so many auditions, <clears throat> excuse me. And that really helped me develop my voice as well by trying different things. So as far as a number, I would say, 30 to four, like 30 a day, do you think is a, a good number? I, I think especially earlier on, you're probably doing 25 to 35. Yeah. And now I maybe do 40. maybe three or four or five a day. Um, and that's where I'm at right now. I, I think that's because A, we have, you know, a busy clientele that keeps us, you know, keeps the workflow going. Um, you're much more picky about your auditions or whether mm -hmm. they're you know, private auditions or something like that instead, mm -hmm. or specific for you. Uh, myself personally, when I started, um, I, I kind of lacked co confidence in my auditioning game. You almost went the opposite of me. Like yeah. I started with lots and then I did not much and he started not doing much. And now he's like the auditioning guy. I, I would do the odd one where I would do like maybe, you know, five to 10 a day. And then I really dug in. I created my own spreadsheet, which I shared with the, the voiceover school alumni where it tracks everything. It tracks your audition book rate, your like rate. Um, even I even got so far as to when I book a job, it puts a value on how much you're getting paid per audition. So it kind of breaks it down to make it like auditioning is part of your job. But you know, w when I decide to go for it, when I decide to put in a little extra effort, when the auditions are there, I'll be doing uh, some days, I think I've maxed at like 35 or 40 auditions. But I'd say on average, without including the weekends, probably, you know, 15 to 30 a day, depending on what the flow is and what else is going on in the day. But um, I know I know Voices.com has a huge flow of auditions and oftentimes, often days I can't keep up with it, which is great, even, <laughs> um, even, even when there's less, but there, there's good quality and diverse ones I really appreciate. Um, I do as many as I can, but but yeah, things have changed a little bit unless I decide to like, okay, you, I'm going to ramp blitz. it up. Yeah, like a we, we, call them, we call them audition blitzes. We have challenges within the group where people <laughs> will just go crazy for a month and then we'll share stats kind of thing, which is which is fun. It's fun. Yeah, that's really that's a really cool kind of, you know, way to push one another. I like that. Yeah. yeah. And just expanding on that, because I know it's something that in regards to voices.com, we chat about quite a bit um, with newer talent. You know, and what would you guys say? I mean, we typically say, you know, if you're doing any more from seven to 10 a day, you know, is a really good starting place and then working your way up from there and getting more comfortable with your workflow. Would you guys agree with that? Or would you guys, you know, have a different? Yeah. Uh, I, you go, I, I think that's a good number because I know when you're starting, your editing isn't as fast. So you really have to take that into consideration. And I feel like uh, when you're newer to your uh, really, um, you know, just making sure that uh, everything is looking good, like your your template um, is written good, and you're you're really looking at things. So you might be a little bit slower then. So I think that's that's a good number. But just uh, you know, when, once you get into it, <clears throat> just just trying to not look back and be like, well, I did ten auditions this week, and well, like, when am I going to book my first job? Just not having that that attitude, having it like 
you know, you're, you're going to do what it takes to, to make it happen. If you really want to do this, not worrying about, you know, your numbers at the moment, just, just, just getting in there and doing as much as possible. I think, I think seven to 10 is, is a great number. I'd say that's even more than, than where I started, where you can begin to book work, but by doing only maybe five, seven, 10, practicing your efficiency of, okay, are you going to read it 10 times or understanding that, you know, with an audition, if it's performed well enough, they're going to get the gist of your tone. Mm -hmm. Are you only doing, you know, a 20 second, 30 second chunk of the audio, or are you trying to do the full two, three minute script for the audition? It's, it's coming up what works for you to be efficient with the auditions and successful with the auditions. And, and just eventually you're going to get faster with them and whatever's available and present. But I, I think you could be a successful working full-time voice actor with seven to 10 auditions a day. And then having Easy. fun with it, like not taking it too seriously, having a lightness behind the microphone and, and portraying that through, through the uh, audio. Through. Well, like when I, when I say through, <laughs> I'm literally imagining my voice going into the microphone. Like I'll, I'll imagine my voice going into the microphone and then into someone's ear. So what's that look like? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's awesome. I really like that. <laughs> All right. Um, here's one. Uh, we were talking about self-care. Um, Paul wants to know um, what advice in regards to like food, drinks, or, you know, things you should avoid, things maybe you should do more of. Um, to make sure that, you know, your voice is, is ready to go and, and you're taking care of, you know, your instrument. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so much. Uh, it, it's as much as you want to get into it. But I mean, eliminating dairy, because we know that causes a lot of phlegm in the body and it causes like, you know, mucus around your vocal cords. Um, you know, I, I like to have like a chart, like just make sure I'm moving my body every day and I'm drinking a lot of water. Dehydration is, you know, one of the main things that can make your voice um, not sound great and, and have that hoarseness or losing your voice and so just trying to eat as clean as possible you know the less ingredients in your food the better um, and just making it a lifestyle because the long game is having your voice you know 10 20 years from now still um, in shape and not um, lethargic and, and feeling uh, tired energy like sometimes there's sessions where you need a lot of energy or you have a six thousand word um, script that comes in. So just being able to maintain that um, in a, in a long-term manner. I agree. And uh, as far as a, a preventive drink of comfort, uh, a lemon, ginger, honey, cayenne drink tea is very soothing and comforting on my throat. I know when, as soon as I get tired or I feel a little bit of an illness or something, I pop one of those teas back. Um, other things uh, to avoid, obviously, like maybe peanut butter before a session, you know, or <laughs> I've also, uh, caffeine has also played an effect on, on my quality of voice as well, where mm -hmm. it can, it can, it can cause strain. It can cause, you know, some mouth noise as well and dehydration. So, yeah, I know there's some people that when they perform or they have something specific come up, they'll go without caffeine. They won't drink coffee in the day until they have their first session and then yes. they'll drink their coffee or something like that. Yeah. Um, what do you think other self-care practices? Yeah, just, voice? just um... Warm, warming up. Yeah, warming morning. up your voice, uh, like humming, simple humming, like mm, is a, is a good good starting point. Uh, or even lip trills, just like. <laughs> <laughs> is something, yeah, just it warms everything up. It, it warm, like vibrates and warms it up. It may look funny, but it's very effective. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, awesome. That, that, that's enough. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, those are those are really great tips, and I I know you know the one I think that we can all relate to really well is you know the caffeine and the coffee. We're all you know, yes. it's that in the morning, so <laughs> it's a good tip to try to, you know, avoid it, especially if you're getting, getting it's, right it's into work. It's literally the first thing I reach for, so. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, no, that's a great piece of advice there. Um, I have a good question in regards to your guys' auditions. So aside from once you, you know, guys book work, when you're auditioning, do you guys submit it raw or do you guys do um, editing where you're using, you know, compressions and, you know, normalization and stuff like that? Um, what is your guys' typical process or advice on, you know, that step of the process in audition? I like, I like to provide a finished audio file, um, showing, showing the quality of my audio, showing the, the capability of, of my post-production. I know there's not, not every voice actor is also a savvy, you know, engineer, editor, mm -hmm. but whatever can be, 
can be clean and makes it sound like you know what you're doing and makes mm -hmm. it sound like you're high quality professional. Personally, I, I remove breaths for the majority of my, um, for my auditions. I normalize to anywhere between minus two or minus three dB. So it's, you know, it's loud enough so that they're not, you know, listening to the, to the headphones uh, straining. And, you know, especially if there's any mouth noise or stuff, I like to take stuff like that out. I'm pretty picky, but that's, that's me. I'm, I'm the, a very picky sound guy. So mm -hmm. I like it to be very clean and crisp. Yeah. And I would say not doing too much compression. Normalizing mm -hmm. is fine, but just not adding in uh, too much compression. You want it to sound uh, very like your voice, like the texture is still there. It's not really like, you know, crushed or anything. So that's, yeah. Rather than compressing, you can, what you can do is manually drop the volume peaks. You know, being a musical producer, I was in metal bands and punk rock bands. So I was all about compression. Some of her first auditioning files were like, sounded like overcompressed metal, metal <laughs> DO, you know, <laughs> and especially on the narration work commercial, you know, usually there's music and sound effects, but narration, the lighter, the, the compression, oftentimes the better, easier it's, on the it's ear. easier on the ear long-term. And then it, especially hearing those nice tones, true tones out of your, out of your voice. Definitely. I think those are great tips. I mean, at the end of the day, they're looking for, you know, what they're kind of expecting is, you know, is, you know, quality, ready to, ready to go to market quality. You know, totally. so when you're able to deliver that, it really, really looks good on yourself. Um, but at the same time, not over editing because it's something you can hear for sure. Yeah, And, and, and Kyle, too much time. something that is really important too, is just taking a quick listen back and, and does it sound like a natural person talking or is there a lot of stop start? And does it sound like I'm reading? Like, could I hear this on TV? Could I hear this on the radio? Like, so just, you know, being really a good, honest check-in with what it sounds like. As like, as like awesome. just an anarchist, I think that a, a raw file could book you a job if the situation is where they're going to send you to a studio anyway, or bring you in studio. But, mm -hmm. you know, I would try to lead, especially with us as working from home voice actors, we want to show our quality and our capability right off the bat. So, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think that's great advice and, and you know, a really good point. You know, you got to got to bring the end quality there and, and showcase that. So um, now I know we are at uh, we've actually gone a little bit over time. Um, so sorry to any questions that we did not get to. Um, I will repeat. So this will this was recorded and it will be sent to everybody who registered for it um, within 24 hours of this. If uh, there is anybody who would like to, you know, send their questions over again, feel free to send the questions to hello at thevoiceoverfamily.com. And you can always check out their website at um, uh, thevoiceoverschool.com. And uh, yeah, they did say that they'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys send over. So um, just thank you so much, Mike and Amanda. It was really amazing having you guys on here. Your guys' knowledge in the industry is, is amazing. So thank you so much for sharing it. And for all the attendees, thank you guys for uh, dedicating the last hour as we talked about. Yes, how thank you. So Thank you so much. Like, I feel like we could talk about this forever. It's so much fun. <laughs> and we love voices.com so much. Love oh, well, we love you guys too. We're <laughs> so happy that you guys spent the time to do this. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. So um, other than that, have everybody a great afternoon and uh, we'll see you all again next month. Take care, you guys. Take care, guys. Bye. Thanks see you, Kyle. Care. See ya. Bye.